Good afternoon. Welcome back. Today I want to talk about what we call the infectious cycle. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is, how we use it to study viruses, how we can measure viruses, and a little bit about the different methods that we use. We're going to talk about a lot of methods in this course, and I want you to at least understand at some level what we're talking about. The infectious cycle is diagrammed here. This is a cell. It's infected with a particular virus. They're very different, the different kinds of viruses in terms of what they do in a cell. And we'll, we'll be going through that throughout this course. But I just want you to look at this as a way of breaking down what a virus does in a cell into, into discrete steps. So the infectious cycle is another name for the replication cycle. That's all, all the things that happen when a virus attaches to a cell, gets in, reproduces, and leaves. Now, virologists divide it into steps so that we can study them. And people specialize. People specialize on entry, protein synthesis, replication, and so forth. Of course, there are no boundaries in cells. We just do that to facilitate our understanding. So look at this diagram here of an infected cell. This happens to be an RNA virus. And you can see some very distinct steps, like attachment and entry. Remember, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to get inside of the cell. So they have to bind to a receptor and be taken in. Now for this virus, that what happens is it's taken in an endosome and then the genome gets out and is in the cytoplasm. It's a little green squiggly line there is the RNA genome of this particular virus. And there, because this is the right kind of RNA, we'll talk about that next time, it can be translated directly into protein. So translation is another step, of course, that we need to go through in order to make more virus particles. Viruses cannot translate their own mRNAs. They depend entirely on the translation apparatus of the host cell. Viral proteins are then made, and those proteins can participate in genome replication, which is shown here. And of course, other proteins that are made by translation are participating in assembly of new virus particles, proteins plus the genome of the virus. And then eventually, these uh, virus particles are released. Those are the general steps of an infectious cycle or a replication cycle. And the, one of the goals of virology is to understand what happens at each one. Now, this is for an RNA virus. For other viruses, the details are going to be different. For example, some viruses will replicate their genomes in the nucleus. And we'll go over some of these differences just to illustrate all the variations on the theme. But essentially, the infectious cycle is what happens in a cell when a virus gets in and eventually leaves. And as I said, virologists try and understand what's going on. The first half of this course, first half, roughly 12 lectures or so, we're going to devote to understanding what goes on in the infectious cycle. Then we're going to, we're going to step back and we're going to look at what happens in a host, in an infected host, okay, when a virus gets into an animal. They're very different things, and we'll spend the remainder of the last half of the course talking about that. Now, there's some terms that I use that are not used by everyone, and I want you to know what they are so you know what I'm talking about. Interestingly, virologists are not very careful about the words they use. Now, I wrote a textbook of virology, and I learned very early on, the first edition, that if you take a word and you use it different ways throughout the text, this is a bad thing, right? If you use it differently in chapter one from chapter three and four, that doesn't work. So we define terms, and we use them the same throughout the textbook, and often I get hell from my virology colleagues they say, this word doesn't mean this. And I said, well, I don't care what you think it means. In our book, it means this, and that's the way we're going to use it. So I've been called pedantic, but I just want to communicate properly. So here are some important definitions. A susceptible cell, that means it has a receptor for a virus. Doesn't matter anything else about the cell, whether the virus can get in and replicate or not. All that susceptible means is that there is a receptor for the virus on the surface. And I, I will be using that throughout this course. Uh, a resistant cell has no receptor. It may, may or may not support virus replication. So you can take nucleic acid out of virus particles and put it separately into the cell, which doesn't require a receptor. Sometimes nucleic acid will replicate in the absence of a receptor. A permissive cell has the capacity to replicate the virus. It has no implications about whether there's a receptor for the virus or not. It just means if the virus could get in and put its nucleic acid in the cell, will it replicate? That's permissivity. And finally, a susceptible and permissive cell is the only one that can take up a virus particle and replicate it. So when I talk about cells that 
are susceptible and permissive means they can bind, they can get in, they can replicate their genomes, they can assemble, and they can make new virus particles. So those are important terms that you should remember because, again, other virologists will use them differently. But if you go back and look at the history of virology, these are the right uh, definitions. Now, in the history of virology, remember at the, at the end of the 1800s, we talked about the discovery of the first virus, tobacco mosaic virus. But for many years, it was very difficult to study animal viruses because we didn't, we didn't have cells in culture. It was easy to study plant viruses. You could just take a plant and rub the virus on it. So we used animals at first, uh, for I'd say the first half, uh, the first 50 years of the 20th century. So we would grow uh, viruses in all kinds of laboratory animals, depending on the virus. You know, each virus needed a different kind of animal. And this, you can imagine, is not ideal. It's not easy. You can't study infections in single cells in an animal. It's just too complicated. Yet that's what virologists did. And you know, to make stocks of viruses, they would inoculate an animal. So they would start with a clinical isolate, a, say a virus from a person with poliomyelitis. They would inoculate it into a monkey. When the monkey got paralyzed, they would sacrifice it, take out the spinal cord, grind it up, and then infect another monkey. Because in the beginning of the 20th century, we didn't have freezers. So they just passed the virus from host to host. At some point, freezers were developed, and they could at least stop doing that and freeze the virus stocks. But for many years, we had to use laboratory animals. One of the more commonly used laboratory animals was the embryonated hen egg, or embryonated chicken egg, which is shown here. And you can see all the different viruses that we used to grow in, in eggs. Uh, these have a little embryo in them. So, uh, you know, at about 12 or 13 days or so, the embryo is a good size. You can make a hole in the shell, and then inoculate virus. And these viruses are replicating in different parts of the egg. You know, there's chorioallantoic membrane, amniotic uh, sac, yolk sac, allantoic fluid, and so forth. Um, the details aren't important for you, just to know that this used to be a common thing with many viruses. We don't use these anymore, except for influenza virus. We inoculate it into the allantoic fluid, uh, which is most of the fluid here in the egg, in a mature egg, it's about 10 milliliters of fluid. And in fact, this is how we make many of the influenza vaccines. We grow them in eggs because it's very easy to purify large quantities of viruses. But we don't do that anymore. You can see here, influenza vaccine production is a big deal globally. And the whole process has been automated. They have racks and racks of embryonated chicken eggs. And a machine drills a hole in them, uh, injects virus, seals it up, and puts it in an incubator for whatever a number of days. Uh, and then they're harvested, a little purification is done, and if you get a flu vaccine, that's what is inoculated into your arm. There are other ways to make flu vaccines, especially for people who have allergies to eggs, but this is still a main one. We use, we make like 150 million doses of flu vaccine a year in the U.S., and one egg makes about one dose uh, of vaccine. Now, in the 1940s, uh, virologist John Enders there on the cover of Time magazine, he figured out how to grow cells in culture so that you could then grow viruses in them. And this wasn't possible before 1949. He and two other individuals figured out how to grow poliovirus in human cell culture. He took embryonic tissues and put them into culture and showed that the virus will grow in them. Again, before this, people did it in monkeys. They grew the virus in monkeys. But this was really a, a groundbreaking discovery. He got the Nobel Prize for that in 1954. That's why he's on the cover of Time. He was working with two other individuals in his lab. I think one of them was a research fellow, the other was a medical student. And he included all, all of them in his Nobel Prize. When they called him and said, we want to give you the Nobel Prize, he said, you have to include my two assistants, which is really cool. Not everybody does that. So nowadays, we grow viruses in cells. Of course, we still uh, infect animals to study disease, of course. But to grow viruses and study single cell replication, we do it in cell cultures. We have a number of different kinds of cell culture that we'll mention throughout this course. On the upper left is an example of primary human foreskin fibroblasts. Now you may think, why foreskin? Well, in a medical center you get foreskins every day, right? Babies are born every day, snip, and they're thrown out. But if you're a scientist, you can go over and uh, get them. And then you bring them back to the lab, you chop them up and dissociate them with trips, and you can make a very nice monolayer of cells. So it's a nice source, it's an unlimited source of cells, basically. There are not many human tissues that you can get so readily, right? Um, the inside of your cheek is another one, you can rub it with a swab and you'll get quite a few primary 
fibroblasts as well. And those will make a nice monolayer. You can infect them with a variety of viruses. The problem is they don't grow forever. Primary cells have a finite lifespan. They can only go through about 30 divisions, and then they die. There are a number of reasons for that, which we'll talk about later on in the course. So they're OK, but then you have to go back and get more cells. And you know, you get them from a different person each time. There's genetic variability. So there are issues associated with primary cells. So we have now made what we call cell lines. And these are two examples. Here's a mouse fibroblast cell line called 3T3. And on the right is the human epithelial cell line, HeLa cell line. These are immortal. They will divide forever because essentially they have lost all of their growth control. We're going to spend a lecture talking about this really interesting property of these cells. And you can grow these forever in your lab. They divide incessantly, and you can use them to infect with viruses and study their replication. Now, that's great that you have them forever. The problem is that they're screwed up. They have the wrong number of chromosomes, like HeLa cells. Have, are, are heteroploid, and each cell doesn't even have the same number of chromosomes. They have way more than 46, and um, they have different numbers of different chromosomes. So if you're worried about that, at gene dosage, for example, that can be a problem. We do have diploid cell strains, which overcome this. These have the right number of chromosomes. They grow a little bit longer than primary cells, maybe 100 divisions, but if you freeze enough of them away, you can deal with that. So this is what we use for studying viruses. Now in the lab, we grow cells in plastic dishes. And these are shown here, plastic dishes and uh, plastic flasks. Um, the cells grow on the plastic. They form a monolayer. They stay attached. And there's a little bit of medium covering it. Uh, you can see the, the little plates and flasks. They have a little bit of medium. Nutrient medium has serum in it and other nutrients to feed the cells so they grow. And you can use these to make more cells or to infect them with viruses and so forth. Uh, we also grow cells in what we call suspension culture. So the first picture I showed you are monolayer cultures. So whenever I talk about that, that's what I mean. This is a suspension. Some cells you can grow like this. This is a, a, um, a spinning magnet in the bottle. And there's a magnet underneath it run by a motor that turns it. And these stay in suspension. They can grow to a lot higher density. So this is a liter of cells, 10 to the fifth cells per milliliter. So that's a lot. You can never achieve that realistically in a monolayer culture. Now, the HeLa cells that I mentioned to you before uh, are an interesting story. These, of course, were made from a woman in, 19, in the early 1950s, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, she had a cervical tumor. Her doctor took a little piece of her tumor and made HeLa cells from them, the first time that had ever been done. And that's the origin of the immortal HeLa cells. That's why this book is called The Immortal Life. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Rebecca Skloot is the author. And of course, the, the story here is they didn't tell her. She died very shortly afterwards. They didn't tell her family until 20 years later. So this is the story of that. It's quite an interesting story. And I think there's a movie being made that's going to be out um, in the spring as well. A, a blank and blank cell is the only cell that can tape up a virus particle and replicate it. Fill in the blanks. Naive and resistant, primary and permissive, susceptible and permissive, susceptible and naive or continuous and immortal. Right, it looks like, wow, 100%. On lecture number two, we already hit 100%. I'm impressed. <laughs> Usually that takes about lecture 10 or 12. All right, susceptible and permissive. It makes me feel good because I explained it, right? Susceptible cells means they have a receptor. Permissive means they are internally able to uh, replicate the virus. Great. Uh, these monolayer cell cultures that I've been talking about, um, there's, there are some ways that we know that virus is growing in them. If we just take a monolayer and put virus on it, how can you tell? One way is shown here. It's called cytopathic effect, or CPE. All right? And we're going to mention this a lot. I'll use the word CPE. All it means is changes in the cells caused by virus infection. There are lots of different kinds of cytopathic effect. A couple of them are shown here. So these are a series of photographs taken of cells uh, infected with poliovirus. On the upper left is the uninfected monolayer. You can see the cells are making a nice sheet. They're touching each other. You can see the individual cells. Four hours later, after infection, you can see some cells, you can see gaps already. Some of the cells are rounded up. And by eight hours, all the cells have rounded up and detached from the monolayer. If you, if you shook them, all those cells would move. 
So the difference here is the monolayer to start is all attached to the plastic. One of the cytopathic effects here is the cells round up and detach, and eventually they all break. In the last, this is 12 hours post-infection on the lower right. The cells have all lysed. So that's two different kinds of cytopathic effects, rounding and detachment and cell lysis. So we use this to check our cultures visually. You can do this through a microscope and see if the virus is replicating. Here's another kind of cytopathic effect. This is called formation of a of syncytia. That's a plural, syncytia. Syncytium would be the singular. What happens here is that for some viruses, when they infect cells, they cause the cells to fuse with neighboring cells. As shown in the upper right here, we have one infected cell with the little red molecules on the surface. That's actually a viral protein that is fusogenic. It can fuse with membranes. We'll talk about that later. So that infected cell can fuse with the neighboring one, and now you have a cell with two nuclei. And this can go on and fuse with additional cells until you get these very large structures. They're called syncytia. Uh, basically, a big fused cell with a lot of nuclei in it. And these are characteristic for very specific viruses. In particular, measles virus does this. And in the old days, before immunization, when lots of kids got measles, a physician would simply look in the mouth. There'd be lesions in the mouth. And he or she could scrape a little bit off and look under a microscope, see syncytia, and say, you got measles. Here's a micrograph on the left of cells infected with a measles-like virus. And you can see individual cells. And then here in the center is a syncytium. It's a big cell with lots of nuclei in it. So another kind of cytopathic effect. There are lots of these. Here's a table of them. You don't need to know these all. I just want you to know that viruses cause changes in cells of different kinds, not just killing them, but changes like syncytium, nuclear shrinking, proliferation of membranes, vacuoles in the cytoplasm, breaking of chromosomes. Here's rounding up and detachment of cells, which I showed you. Uh, a lot of viruses make what we call inclusion bodies. They replicate in very specific areas in the cell, and you can actually see those in a microscope as time goes on. And they're characteristic for the virus. Uh, virus, virus particles in the nucleus or the cytoplasm, when you get enough of them, you can actually see them in the light microscope, etc. So these are all different kinds of cytopathic effects. So I want you to understand what a cytopathic effect is. I would never ask you to memorize all of them. That's not the point of this course. You just need to know that there are many different things that a virus can do to an infected cell. Here's an example of a question I could give you. I would show you a picture of an uninfected and an infected cell. And the infected cell has clumps of virus particles. I said, what do you call this? And you, the answer would be cytopathic effects. That's, that's really the, the basis here. All right, now let's move to quantification. We can grow viruses in cells. Next step is to know how many virus particles there are there. Because if you want to do experiments, you have to put a defined number of viruses on cells or into animals. So we have to be able to quantify. And we have two broad ways of measuring virus particles. One is by infectivity. We can actually measure infectious viruses. And a second is physical measurements. This doesn't tell you infectivity, just the number of particles and their components. So I want to go through some of these today and tell you about them. Let's start with a, with a infectious assay. And this is the plaque assay. This is one of the greatest assays in all of science, in my opinion. It is a way of measuring infectivity. This was developed in the 1930s by virologists studying bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect bacteria. And what they do is they take a plate with auger in it, and they make a lawn of bacteria on the surface. So this cloudy uh, surface is, is a confluent lawn of bacteria that have grown. And then uh, these are mixed with virus particles. And they can make different dilutions of virus particles and put them on different plates. And each virus, when it infects a cell, will undergo multiple cycles of replication. It will infect the first cell, kill it. The virus will be released, infect neighboring cells. And eventually, you will get a plaque where the bacteria have been lysed. You get a clearing, and that causes a physical plaque. You can count these and say, I have X number of plaque-forming units in my stock. So that's how we measure the infectivity. Uh, this was adopted to animal viruses in 1952 uh, by Renato Dulbecca, working at Caltech. He took what people had done for, animal, for uh, bacteriophages, and he adopted it to animal viruses. The difference is, first of all, he used a monolayer. This is very hard to see. But um, he uses a monolayer of animal cells in a round dish here infects them with viruses, and then he puts an auger overlay on top 
to restrict the movement of virus, and then uh, you get the formation of small plaques. We'll have a better picture than that in the moment. And this is a very interesting article here, production of plaques on, in monolayer tissue cultures by single particles of an animal virus. That was the paper he published in 1952. So remember that name, Renato Del Becco, not because I'm going to ask you it, but he's going to figure again when we talk about viruses that cause cancer. He had a big role to play in that. So here's how a plaque assay works. You have a stock of virus. You want to know how much infectious virus is present. You make tenfold dilutions in buffer of some kind, usually PBS, phosphate buffered saline. You take 0.9 mLs and you put them in a bunch of tubes. And you take 0.1 mL of your stock, put it in the first tube, mix it up. That's a tenfold dilution, 10 to the minus 1. And you do the same thing, 0.1 mL. You make tenfold dilutions all the way down the line. And then you take a little bit of each, 0.1 mL typically, uh, take a plate of cells, remove the medium, add the virus, let the virus adsorb the cells for typically an hour, and then you put an agar overlay on top of the cells. And what will happen is the virus uh, infects cells and eventually kills enough of them so that you can see a visible plaque. Then you can count the number of plaques. Here is a good plate for us to count because it has a countable number. Typically between 10 and 100 or so is countable. We have 17 plaques. And if you take into considering the dilution, which is 10 to the minus 6, plus another tenfold dilution, we, point, we played out only 0.1 mLs, it's 1.7 times 10 to the eighth plaque forming units per mil. So that's how we can use a, a plaque assay to measure how many viruses we have. We can see that better in this uh, diagram. So here on the top left is our monolayer, and we're expanding just a little bit of it. So here is one cell that was infected with a virus particle. That's going to lyse and release viruses. They're going to infect neighboring cells, and they're going to be killed. They'll release particles. So basically, this hole in the monolayer is going to get bigger and bigger until you can see it. And then you stain the cells, and you can see plaques. So the function of the agar overlay is to make sure the viruses are restricted to the area of the initially infected cell. If you had liquid on top of these cells, all the cells would simply be killed because the virus would diffuse everywhere. You couldn't count anything. Now on the bottom is a microscopic examination of a single plaque. So here's the monolayer of cells, and in the middle the cells have died, and they're rounded up and detached. And on the right, we actually use a virus that makes an enzyme that gives a blue color. So you can actually see the plaque uh, formed in that way if you can't see it morphologically. So there are many ways that you can count plaques. One of them is to stain the monolayer and count the holes. Another one is to have the virus make a dye and count the colors. So here's a movie of plaque formation. In my opinion, the greatest movie ever made. I used to teach this course without the benefit of this movie, and then a couple of years ago it was made. What they did is they infected a monolayer. It's repeating over and over. It's a time lapse of about 15 hours or so taking a frame every minute. They infected a monolayer of cells, and then they focused the microscope on a single focus, which in the very beginning you can see in the middle there, and then they just took frames. And you can see the, the plaque growing as the virus replicates and spreads outward. And it's amazing, it does so in a perfect circle. You can see the cells are detaching and dying. They're coming refractory to light. They get shiny, that's a consequence of them dying. And that's the formation uh, of a plaque there. It's like dropping a a pebble in a pond, and then the, the waves go outward. It's just so beautiful. I, I could look at this for a long time, but I know you don't want to. Uh, so that's the plaque formation. It was done by a group at Oxford University in the UK. So we do a lot of plaque assays in my lab. We're crazy about them, and I have this wall that I built a number of years ago. I call it the wall of polio because this was one polio experiment done by a postdoc in my lab. It's done with six well plates. They're all on their side here. And she did this 1,600 plate experiment. And she said, what should I do with them? I said, let's build a wall. So I, this, is in my, this is in my office. And then someone sent me the, the Pink Floyd poster here later. So if you come for office hours, uh, you can come. And, and I have now have a website where I have pictures of people in front of the wall, including some famous virologists like Jonas Salk's son came and visited. I took his picture in front of it as well. If you want to become a little part of history, uh, you can stop by and check that out. It's glued. It's not going anywhere. And um, I call it my masterpiece. I really like it. OK, the next uh, question. When doing a plaque assay, what's the purpose of adding a semi-solid agar overlay on the minor layer of infected cells to stabilize progeny virions to ensure that the cells remain susceptible and permissive to act as a pH indicator to keep cells adherent to the plate 
during incubation or to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. Well, a little more diverse answers here. So 72% of you got E to restrict viral diffusion after lysis, and that's the correct answer. That's why we put an agar overlay on, because if we had just liquid, when viruses are released from cells, they would spread throughout the culture and you wouldn't be able to count a plaque. A plaque is a focus of dead cells, and that is made by the agar on top. Uh, to keep the cells adherent, you don't need agar to keep cells adherent because they would remain adherent under liquid. That's the beauty of these monolayer cultures. They stick really tightly to the plastic. And susceptible and permissive and to stabilize virions are, are certainly not parts of that. So here is a lovely picture of a plaque assay, or a picture of a lovely plaque assay, I should say. Uh, this, I think, is influenza virus. And you can see these are three dilutions of virus that have been plated uh, to, to higher. So you see more viruses here on the left, less in the middle, and more on the right. You would pick the one in the middle. It's got a countable number, usually between 10 and 100 plaques. If there are too many plaques, you can't count them well because they tend to fuse to one another. Uh, and if they're too few, it's not statistically relevant. So you'd pick the number here. You know, if there are 15 plaques on these plates, you know the dilution of the, uh, of the what you plated, and plus you plated 0.1 ml. That's another tenfold dilution. You could calculate the PFU uh, per mil. Now, an important question is, how many viruses are needed to form a plaque? Do you need just one? Do you need more than one? This is an important question because uh, when virologists began studying viruses and doing plaque assays, they didn't know the answer. They didn't know how many virus particles you would actually need to form a plaque. And uh, if you needed more than one, that would be interesting because there would be various explanations for that. The way you answer this question uh, is, and you only need to do this once for your particular virus, it's been done for all of them, is a dose response curve. So basically, you take different dilutions of virus, you make dilutions of viruses here, it's, it's, it's increasing. So we're going from less concentrated to more concentrated. And then you do a plaque assay at each dilution and you, pl pl plate, uh, you, sorry, you um, plot the number of plaques on the y-axis. So if you need just one virus to make a plaque, that's called one-hit kinetics. In that case, the number of plaques is directly proportional to the first power of the concentration of the virus. In other words, if the concentration of virus is doubled, the number of plaques is doubled. And you can see that red line right there, you double uh, the concentration, you go from 0.25 where you get six plaques to 0.5, you get 12 plaques. So that's one hit, kinetics, a straight line. It tells you that one virus is sufficient to make a plaque. That's the case for most viruses, but there are some that need more than one virus to form a plaque. And one of them is shown here. This is a two hit, a virus with two hit kinetics. You need two distinct particles to make a plaque. And there you get this curve uh, where the number of plaques is proportional to the square of the concentration, okay? It's different from the straight line. It gives you this a curve, two hits, you need two different viruses. You may ask why would you need two? For some viruses, interestingly, uh, the genome is packaged in two pieces in two different particles. It seems weird, right? You would put half the genome in one particle and half in another, and you need both of them to infect the cell. We, they're out there, it works. I can't explain why because, uh, well, we can't explain why questions in biology anyway, but um, it works for many viruses uh, that seem to infect plants and maybe because the viruses are carried by insect vectors that it's likely that you could get many of any particles infecting a cell. Most animal viruses that we know of, the genome is in one particle and, and therefore you need one to in make, infect a cell and make a plaque. Now, the plaque assay is also useful for a procedure we call plaque purification. And this is where you do a plaque assay and you can pick, you can take a single plaque. You typically take a pipette and you plunge it into the agar over the plaque. And that piece of agar, that little plug, has virus in it. And it's, it's the progeny of a single plaque. And so it should be somewhat purified compared to the original stock. So if you, for example, took some nasal wash from a patient with influenza, and you plaqued it out, you could pick a single plaque and have a relatively genetically pure uh, culture of viruses. Now, as we'll see later, this is actually not true because of a variety of properties of viruses that we'll talk about, but it's still a commonly used procedure to make sure you're working with a relatively pure stock. And we usually do it three times. We'll pick a plaque, grow it up, do another plaque assay, pick another plaque, do that three times. If you look in the literature, you'll see people doing that. Again, to make a clonal virus stock. 
Now, some viruses simply don't form plaques for whatever reason, but there are other ways we can measure infectivity. I'm just going to show you one. It's called an endpoint dilution assay. What you do is you have 96 well plates in which each well is a flat bottom well. It's got a little mini cell culture in it. And you infect uh, with dilutions of your virus, and you do it in multiple samples. So you have 10 to the minus 2 dilution. You infect all of those wells across the plate with minus two, minus three, minus four. You incubate, and then you simply ask, is the virus causing cytopathic effect? You can look at the uh, wells under a microscope, or you could stain them after a certain number of days. And then you score plus for CPE and minus for no CPE. So the virus is replicating, it's killing the cells, but it's not forming plaques. And then you score this, and you can see at the low dilutions, uh, all of the wells are infected. They're all showing CPE. But then as you dilute out, minus 4, 5, 6, you can see there's more and more negatives, which you would expect because you're putting less and less virus in. And by minus 7, none of the wells have received any virus. What you can do now is calculate the dilution of virus where 50% of the wells show evidence of infection. That's called a TCID50, tissue culture infectious dose 50%. It's just a way of making a standard calculation that different laboratories could then compare. You say, my stock of this virus has 50 TCID50s. And the way you calculate that is you look for the dilution where half of the wells are plus and half are negative. And that happens to be minus 5 because I made this up. Because in, in nature, in life, it never falls on a dilution. You always have to use math to interpolate between two dilutions. But here you can see there are 5 plus and 5 minuses. So that would be your TCID50. Uh, at a dilution of 10 to the minus 5. Another issue we have to talk about is what's called the particle to PFU ratio of virus. This is the number of physical particles divided by the number of infectious particles. It's not the same thing. For some viruses, it's very close. But for most, there are way more particles than infectious particles. So I've shown you from the dose response curve of the plaque assay that a single particle can initiate infection, can make a plaque. But in reality, most, not all viruses are successful at doing that. Why not? Well, in any given preparation of virus that you may grow in the lab, you can have damaged particles, you can have mutations uh, in the genome. You know, that infectious cycle, going through all those steps, if you fail at any one step, you don't get an, an output of virus. So it's a complex cycle. So for whatever reason, these and other reasons as well, not every virus particle is infectious. And you can imagine this is, makes it complicated to study virus particles. If you're looking at, say, infected cells by electron microscopy, and you're watching a virus get into an endosome and then moving through the cell, how do you know that's an infectious particle? If the ratio, say, is 1,000 to 1, 1,000 particles for one infectious particle. So this has always been a conundrum for virologists over the years to try and overcome this. Let me show you some examples of particle to PFU ratios of some animal viruses. Now you can see they range from one or two. So this is a wonderful virus called Semliki forest virus. And um, this, this, this virus, by the way, is named, someone was in Africa and they had isolated this virus from animals. And uh, the guy who did it asked his, um, his partner there, what's this place called? And the guy said Semliki. So he called it Semliki forest virus, but it turns out that semliki means forest. <laughs> and he was telling him, you're in a forest. So now we have a forest forest virus. Anyway, this is a particle to PFU ratio of one or two. So that means almost every particle that you have, physical particles, can initiate an infection. But look at some of these other viruses ranging from 10 to 100 to 1,000, even 10,000. So papillomaviruses, which we'll talk about later, for every 10,000 particles, physical particles, only one is infectious. Now, again, for whatever reason, defective particles, mutations, et cetera, that's the way this is, and it's what you have to deal with uh, when you study it. So that's why I, make, I, I mention this at all, to emphasize the experimental issues that this can lead to. All right, next we have in particle to PFU ratio. Particle can best be described as one of the proteins which makes up the virion, a virus which may or may not be infectious, a virus which is infectious, a virus which is not infectious, elementary or composite. Right? Most of you got B, which is correct. A virus which may or may not be infectious. That's what particle is. Remember, particle is everything in your stock, both the non-infectious and the infectious particles. 
It's not a protein. It's the vi we're referring to the virus particle. Uh, the, the particle may be infectious, but it's not just infectious. Not all of them are infectious, and it's not, not all of them are non-infectious. All right, now in the uh, first talk last time, we talked about a one-step growth cycle. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this and what good is it. The one-step growth cycle was first done in 1939, again by virologists who were studying bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria. And that's one shown here attached to an E. coli. And they wanted to know how the different steps of the infectious cycle proceeded. So what they did was they would take bacteria and add bacteriophage to them. They would let the phage absorb, that means attach to the surface of the bacteria. They would then dilute the culture. And what that does, it prevents any further attachment of new virus particles. So it effectively synchronizes the infection. At the moment of dilution, only those viruses that are attached are going to go on and replicate uh, in, that in that bacterial culture. At different times after dilution then, they would sample uh, the culture and do a plaque assay to measure infectious virus production. And they would graph it. And here on the left is an example which we showed last time. It's a growth curve where we're measuring with time on the x-axis. We're looking at the number of infectious particles on the y-axis and it's by a plaque assay. And you can see when you dilute the culture and take time points, there's this eclipse period, which we talked about last time, during which you can't detect any infectious virus by a plaque assay. And that's because the virus you've added to the culture has attached to cells. It's put its genome into the cell, and the genome itself is not infectious in a plaque assay. Only the virus particle is. Then after a certain period of time, which depends on the virus, it can be minutes or it can be hours or days, uh, you then see infectious viruses being produced. We call this the, the bacteriophage. People called it the burst or the yield because it happened very quickly and then maximized because there are no more hosts left for virus to replicate in. So that's a one-step growth curve. All the cells are infected. They all go through the virus infectious cycle at the same time, and they all release virus more or less at the same time. Now, you can change this growth curve into a multi-step growth curve by infecting fewer cells to begin with. So you, instead of adding enough virus so that all the cells are infected, you can make dilutions and you get a, a curve like shown on the right, where fewer cells are initially infected. So again, you have at the start, when you dilute your culture, you have an eclipse period. Uh, then you have the first burst, but not all cells are infected at, during that first burst. Those virus produced will then go on in the culture, which is a liquid culture. It's not an agar overlay. They will infect other cells, and then you get a second burst. And de depending on how dilute you make the virus, you can have multiple bursts of infection. So this is really an important concept, the idea that you can infect all the cells synchronously in a culture and get a one-step curve, or you can infect with fewer viruses and get a multi-step curve. The reason it's interesting is because when we study the effect of mutations in viruses, sometimes they don't have an apparent effect in a single cycle. But if you make a multi-cycle growth curve, you can see the difference. And here's an example of a growth curve with an animal virus. This is adenovirus, which is a large DNA virus we'll talk about later. You can take cells in culture, animal cells in culture, do the same kind of experiment. Infect the, the cells under liquid. You can add enough virus to infect every cell. Add medium, uh, dilute out the inoculum, add medium, and then take time points and pl plot the plaque forming units per mil with time. And you can see here with this animal virus, there's also an eclipse period, a time where we don't see infectivity because, again, the genome has come out of the particle and it's not infectious in our plaque assay. And then at about 12 hours here for adenovirus, you see the beginning of virus produced. And eventually that peaks when, this, when the culture is dead. Now, this, th these two curves, which are just duplicates, this red and this blue curve, what we're doing here is measuring intracellular virus. So this is a twist on the experiment. We're actually taking, we're doing multiple plates of cells and at each time point we take one plate, we take the medium off, scrape up the cells and break them open and measure the number of infectious viruses in the cell. So that's what these two lines are, the blue and the red. If instead you take a little bit of the cell culture medium and measure virus in at, that's extracellular virus. So there's a difference because the virus is first made in the cell, of course, and it's got to get out. Cells have to break or there has to be some other mechanism for the virus to get out. And if you plot the two, intracellular versus extracellular, you can see there's a difference. So virus production intracellularly begins at about 12 hours post-infection. But you don't see any virus in the medium until four hours later. 
when you finally can see extracellular virus. So it takes about four to five hours for virus from the time it's completed in the cell to, to get out of the cell and into the extracellular medium. So that's really illustrating all the different kinds of information you can get from this single step growth curve. And I want to emphasize that this is, as we said last time, it's very different from bacteria. Bacteria, you put a single bacterium in a broth, it divides, and those two divide again and again, and so on by binary fission. There's no eclipse period, as there are with viruses, because the, the eclipse period is the time during which all the viral proteins have to be made, genomes have to be replicated, and assembly has to take place. So synchronous infection is really the key to this one-step growth curve, to infect all the cells and to get them to initiate the infection at the same time. So we have to infect all the cells. So how would you know if you infected them or not? How would you know how much virus to put on the cell culture to get all of the cells infected? That's what I want to talk about now. And this has to do with what we call multiplicity of infection. MOI, I'll, I'll refer to it from time to time. This is simply the number of infectious particles that you add per cell. And, and step back and think about that again. The number of particles, infectious particles, not total particles, infectious particles that you add per cell. It is not the number of particles that each cell receives. There is a difference. So for example, if you add 10 to the 7th virus particles, infectious virus particles to a million cells, that MOI is 10. It's a straight math divide the number of viruses by the number of cells. Each cell, however, doesn't get 10 virus particles for reasons that I'm going to tell you in a moment. So best way I like to illustrate this is, let's say there are 100 people in this room who had a bucket of 100 tennis balls. If I could somehow throw them out to you all at once, you're not each going to get one. Some of you are going to get a lot. Maybe people in the front here are going to get a lot. Some of you might not get any. Some of you might get one. It's the same thing with adding viruses to a cell culture. And fortunately, we have a formula which describes the distribution of tennis balls to an audience or viruses to cells, and that's the Poisson distribution. So basically, the Poisson distribution describes how many particles each cell gets when you add so many to them. And that's because infection depends on random collisions. This is a random event occurrence. When you mix cells with virus, some cells are uninfected, some receive one, two, or three or more particles, very much like the tennis ball experiment. So this kind of distribution was studied for many years, and the conclusion is the Poisson distribution best describes it. So that's what we use to calculate the MOI. So at the top is the Poisson formula, where PK is the fraction of cells infected by K virus particles, and M, little m is the multiplicity of infection. And you can simplify this formula as shown at the bottom here. P0, uninfected cells, is simply e to the minus m, natural log uh, to the minus m. Cells receiving one particle, P1 is m times e to the minus m. And cells uh, multiply infected, P greater than 1, is shown by this formula, which is simply obtained by subtracting from 1 the sum of all probabilities for uh, any value of k, which be P0 and P1. So this is not really difficult at all. I'm going to show you in a moment. But you can plug into this uh, your multiplicity of infection and figure out how many cells in a culture uh, receive no viruses, one, and more than one virus. So here's some examples of that on the top. If you take a million cells and you infect them at a multiplicity of 10, you use the formula I showed you on the previous slide. 45 cells are uninfected, so that's not many. Most of the cells are infected. 450 get one, but the rest receive more than one particle. So an MOI of 10 is a great MOI if you want to infect every cell and do a one-step synchronous growth curve, because you can see in a, in a million cell culture, hardly any are uninfected. Now, if you use an MOI of one, it's a different story. 37% of the cells are uninfected, 37% get one particle, and 26% get more than one. So here, 37% uninfected, you could probably see a two-step growth curve. Initially, uh, 37 plus 26% will be infected. They'll make virus, and that virus will then go on to infect the 37% that are uninfected. You can even go at a lower MOI, 0.001. Here, almost all the cells are uninfected, 99.9%. Uh, 990 cells receive one particle, and uh, a very small 
percentage received more than one. So if you want to see multiple growth cycles more than two, you would do an MOI of 0.001. So this is how we know how many cells in our culture are infected. Now, we typically simply use five or 10 all the time. That'll infect every cell in your culture, and, and that, that's good for growing virus stocks. It's good for studying most mutants and so forth. But in certain cases, if you want to infect fewer cells, that's why uh, diluting the stock gives you fewer cells infected. But if you only remember one thing, just remember that an MOI of 10 doesn't mean that every cell receives 10 virus particles. It simply is what you add to the culture. All right, the next question. If cells are infected at an MOI of 10, in a one-step growth cycle, the growth curve you will likely see A, multiple bursts of virus release, B, multiple eclipse periods, C, a single burst of virus release, D, no burst of virus release, or E, asynchronous infection. Most of you got a single burst of virus release. MOI of 10, basically all the cells are infected. You're gonna get one burst and that's it. There's no more cells left to infect. You're not gonna get multiple eclipse periods. That would be an MOI of one or less. Um, multiple bursts of virus release or multiple eclipse periods, neither one, you're gonna have one, an asynchronous infection. You know, you're infecting all the cells together. That's why it's a synchronous infection. So that's using measurements of infectivity to ask how much virus is in a culture. I wanna talk a little bit about physical measurements of virus particles because these will come up in our discussions. I want you to understand them. And here are some, we'll go through uh, hemagglutination, which uses red blood cells to measure viruses. Electron microscopy, you simply look, you can look at a virus preparation and count the number of particles. I'm not going to say anything more about that. We don't do that very much anymore. Uh, we can measure viral enzymes. Some virus particles actually have enzymes in them, proteins that have an enzymatic activity that we can assay. So we can use that as a surrogate for infectivity. We use serology. We use antibodies a lot in virology to measure virus proteins and virus particles. And we also use assays to measure nucleic acids, really uh, very, very commonly used techniques. Hemagglutination is probably the first uh, virus assay developed before the plaque assay for animal viruses. And this only works with certain viruses that can bind red blood cells. So it turns out that some viruses bind to cell receptors that are proteins, typically glycoproteins, that also happen to be on the surface of red blood cells. It's easy to get chicken or guinea pig or any kind of red blood cell, and you simply uh, wash the red blood cells, you mix them with your virus. The virus shown here in this diagram is sticking to the red blood cell. And then this will make a lattice of red blood cells because one red blood cell covered with viruses will stick to another one, which will stick to another one. And eventually you make a sheet of red blood cells. And if you do this in a 96 well format, a virus that hemagglutinates makes nice sheets. You can see on the bottom, Sample, these are dilutions, two-fold dilutions of a virus stock. The top is the control, there's no virus in it. You can see the red blood cells all tumble down to the bottom of the well, they make a nice little button. The bottom, there's a virus containing sample, which you can see makes nice little sheets uh, out to about 1,000, 1 to 1,024 there. So I would say the tighter of this is 1 to 1,024. The reason there's a button in the first well is something we'll talk about later, but these viruses also have an enzyme that can cleave this bond between the virus and the red blood cell. And that's, since it's so concentrated there, that's why that's evident. So this is a rough way to measure physical particles. It's not an infectivity assay. Uh, many viruses, as I said, have enzymes in them. The family we'll talk about the most, the retrovirus family, have several enzymes in them, and one of them uh, which we'll talk about a lot, is the reverse transcriptase. It's in the virus particle along with the genome. Not every virus has an enzyme or any kind of protein inside the particle. Some do, and we'll talk about the rules for understanding why next time. Retroviruses have reverse transcriptase. It's an interesting enzyme that can take RNA and make a DNA copy out of it. So you can do an assay for that. It's a very simple assay, and the assay is shown on this slide. Here we have uh, several cells infected with a retrovirus called XMRV, and at different times after infection, we take a little bit of the supernatant and we do a, an assay for reverse transcriptase to see if infection is going on. The assay is very simple. You take a little bit of the supernatant, you break open the virus particles with a detergent to allow the enzyme to come out. You add uh, RNA, you add a primer, and some radioactive nucleotides. 
And then if there's an enzyme present, we'll make a DNA copy, which you can then filter through nitrocellulose, and the radioactivity will show up as a dark spot on X-ray film. So you can see th these particular cells uh, have, are infected. They're, they're making viruses in the supernatant that has uh, reverse transcriptase in them. These cells are not infected, and these cells are infected. So again, it's not an infectivity assay. You're measuring enzyme and virus particles. Not all of them may be infectious, but again, it's a surrogate for when you can't do a plaque assay. We use antibodies extensively for research and diagnosis of virus infections. The, the format is typically an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. And we can use this to detect viral proteins or virus antibodies. And they're both shown on here. So let's go through this. On the left, we're looking for viral antigens. <clears throat> we have a sample, a blood sample. We want to know if the person's infected with HIV. You're looking for a viral protein in the blood. So what you do is you take a plastic support, and you have an antibody that you've produced in the lab or you can purchase which is specific for the viral protein. You can put that antibody on the plastic very easily, and then you take your clinical specimen and add it to the plastic. If there's any viral antigen present, the antibody will capture it. And then you can detect the viral antigen by using a second antibody, again, to the viral protein, which has a indicator, a fluorescent indicator, an enzyme that can give you a readout very easily. So again, we're looking for viral antigen here. That's why we call these capture antibodies. It's also called a sandwich ELISA because we're sandwiching the antigen between two antibody molecules. Now, you can also look for antibodies. Now, if, if, uh, if you suspect someone might have had influenza, but it's now a month after infection, the virus is likely gone, so you're not going to see viral proteins. You look for antibodies instead. And so what you can do is you can put viral antigens on the plastic. Just like we could put an antibody on the plastic, we can put an antigen on the plastic, and then we incubate serum or nasal wash, whatever your specimen is. If there are any antibodies in the sample, they will bind to the viral antigen, and then we can use an anti-IgG or anti-IgM to detect the presence of the antibody in the sample. And again, this is typically coupled to an indicator that you can readily see fluorescence, fluorescent protein, enzymes that make a color, anything you can measure uh, very readily. So we're going to talk a lot about using ELISAs to measure antigens or antibodies. These are the two formats that are used. Now these have both been adopted to rapid diagnostics in physician offices, for example. They're dipstick tests, very similar to the ones used to detect pregnancy. Those are detecting hormones in urine, and they consist of a solid support over which the material flows and reacts uh, with uh, antibodies. So here we have the format to detect uh, a clinical sample, we're looking for viral antigens. So there are a few of these that are available now. They're not great in terms of the reliability, but in five years or so, they're going to be routinely used. You can go to your doctor's office and know if you have influenza right away, for example. So the doctor would put a little nasal wash on this pad. It's a, it's a wicking pad so that um, the sample placed here would then flow down by capillary action towards the other end. Embedded at the left end here are some control antibodies to make sure the assay is working. If you have viral antigens in your sample, when they reach this line of antibodies to your viral, they're going to react with it, uh, and they're going to bind with the indicator, colloidal gold antibodies. The, the control is going to be positive as well. So you'll basically see two lines showing you that you have a positive test. If you had only the control line illuminating, it would, not be, it would be negative, of course. And if you just had the test line positive and not the control, that would mean the assay didn't work. So you'd probably have to do it again um, and move on. So these aren't great, but they're getting better. It's a neat way to combine ELISA technology in a rapid format. We can also use fluorescent proteins to uh, find viruses in cells. This is a really cool experiment where herpes viruses have been labeled with, um, I think, seven different fluorescent proteins. You know, green fluorescent protein, the original one, has now morphed into many, many different colors. And this is a cool experiment where they made seven different herpes viruses with each a distinct color. And you can infect cells and see not only the seven colors, but mixtures of them showing multiply infected cells. So it's green fluorescent protein and all of its colored derivatives, the cyans and the reds and so forth, are used extensively uh, in virology. Here's another example of that where we've made 
a herpes virus. This is the genome of herpes virus, and we've inserted the gene for green fluorescent protein. So when we infect a neuron, the virus uh, infects the cell, produces GFP, and it illuminates the cell body, the dendrites, and the axons. And these kinds of viruses can actually be used for neuronal tracing. You can stereotactically inoculate animals in a very specific part of the brain with these viruses, and then you can look at the wiring of the nerves from that site uh, by tracing green fluorescent protein. We're also able to make colored virus particles. So here's an HIV particle that contains green fluorescent protein in the structural proteins. So it's very bright and you can see it by light microscopy. So this would be too small to see in a light microscope if it weren't fluorescent. But the green gives up a lot of light so it amplifies the size of the particle. And these are actually individual HIV particles uh, moving down the cytoskeleton in an infected cell. The red is a, is a stain for tubulin and this is showing us how the viruses in the cell move along the cytoskeletal network. You can see them moving here on the bottom. There's a whole new area of uh, my microscopy that has arisen simply because we have these wonderful fluorescent uh, proteins that we can label viruses and viral genomes with. Now another technique that we use extensively, we'll talk about all the time in this course, of course is polymerase chain reaction or PCR. It's a reaction where you can detect very, very small quantities of nucleic acids, either DNA or RNA. Uh, if you start with a sample that you think contains DNA, double-stranded DNA, you denature it, you anneal oligonucleotides that you know are complementary to the sequence, you elongate those to make a copy, uh, and now you have four copies where you once had two. You can then take those four copies, denature them, add oligonucleotides again, extend them, you'll now have eight, and you'll have 16 and 32, and you do many, many cycles of this up to 30, you get ex exponential sh growth of a short product, which then you can easily detect on a gel. So if you have vanishingly small starting material, you can have within uh, six hours or so enough material to sequence or to see on a gel. Now this is all done in one tube in a thermal cycler that raises the temperature to denaturation over 90 degrees anneals it at 70 degrees and then allows enzymatic reactions for the extension at 37 degrees. These are all Celsius numbers. And th those enzymes have to be thermostable. And this whole technique began because a microbiologist named Thomas Brock in the 1960s was interested in what could grow in hot springs like this one. Yellowstone and all these national parks uh, throughout the U.S. There are hot springs with uh, waters up to 100 degrees Celsius where bacteria can live. And he isolated these bacteria, and it turned out that the polymerase, the DNA polymerase from them, could stand repeated cycles of heating to 95 degrees and, and lowering to 37 and still be active. So the first polymerase used for this was called TAC, T-A-Q, for Thermus aquaticus, which was the first bacteria that Brock isolated from these uh, hot springs. Now, I make a point of mentioning this because today, if you, if you told some politicians that you wanted to study bacteria in a hot spring, they would say, what the hell are you going to do that for? It's not going to help anyone's health. The whole point is serendipity. You let scientists do what they want, and they will find cool things. Thomas Brock, we gave him the money to look in a hot spring. Who knew what would come out of it? He was just curious, and he found something that revolutionized not only research, but industry, Diagnosis, forensics, all these areas completely revolutionized by PCR. No one had a clue that this would be useful. CRISPR today that we can use to engineer changes in genes, an accident. Nobody knew what good it was. Jennifer Doudna, who will probably get the Nobel Prize for it one day, she said when someone told her to work on it, she said, why should I work on this obscure system in bacteria? I have no idea what good it is. Over and over again, you see this in science. There's so many great examples. And when people say, I don't understand why you're studying flies or worms or bacteria in hot springs, you got to tell them this is why, because cool, cool discoveries come from serendipity. So in virology, we use this a lot, PCR, and we're going to talk about it quite often uh, throughout this course. Another technology we use is related to DNA sequencing. Now, when I um, was training as a postdoc, my project was to sequence the genome of poliovirus which was 7,500 bases long. I had to make a DNA copy of it and then do manual laborious reactions. It took me one year to do that whole sequence. This has now been totally changed. We have techniques called deep high throughput sequencing where 
first of all, people don't do it anymore. You, you give it to a machine. And my polio genome of 7,500 could be done in an hour. <laughs> in fact, the human genome was originally, it took 10 years using this technology to sequence the human genome. Three billion dollars. This was a big project way back when, before deep sequencing was developed. Today, you can sequence a whole genome at, in one day for 1,500 bucks, and that price keeps dropping. And that's because of the technologies, which we don't have time to go into, but they, they allow you to take a piece of DNA. I would sequence it once or twice for polio. You can now sequence it hundreds and hundreds of times. That's called deep sequencing, and you can do it really quickly. What does this do for you? Well, we can do metagenomics. We can take dirt or ocean or blood or any sample, and we can just sequence all the nucleic acid in it and see what viruses are present. We can identify new viruses, as I told you a little bit about last time, identify new pathogens. So really, we'll talk a lot about this in this course as well. By the way, this is how I sequenced polio, by running gels and reading the sequence by hand on an electroradiogram. This is not deep, high throughput sequencing. The deep sequencing is done, it's all automated. All the nucleotides that are, are used in the reactions are just detected by machines, and that's why it's very, very rapid. And there are lots of companies that sell these machines. There are lots of technologies. Uh, essentially, one day, when you're born, you're going to have your genome sequence. It's going to go into a database, and all of your health care is going to depend on that. We're not there yet. It's a while yet, but it's going to happen. Now, we've done a couple of podcasts where we talk about using this technology to identify new viruses. Uh, th these are cool. The one on the left here was the identification of a snake virus. Now, this is a story. Joe DeRisi is a very well-known virologist at UCSF, and a woman sent him a uh, a letter one day with a picture of her snake who was very snick, sick. She had the picture around her neck and she said, my snake is really sick. Can you figure out what's wrong with it? You know, he put it away for a while, but then he somehow got interested in it and they went to a vet and it turns out there's a snake disease that's very common, inclusion body disease. So he got samples from various vets. He sequenced them and they found a new virus that causes this snake disease. Uh, here on the right is another virus found in... Um, uh, it's called Heartland virus. Two patients in Missouri had severe febrile illness. Turned out they were people who worked outside. They had been bitten by ticks. They got blood from these individuals, did some sequencing, and found a new tick-borne virus. So this is the sort of thing that you can do. These are examples of disease-driven discovery. But remember, you can just take any sample and look for viruses that are maybe not associated uh, with disease. Now, I've been touting the power of this nucleic acid-based identification, but I want to leave you with the warning. Finding DNA doesn't mean you have infectious virus. Like finding bacterial DNA on ATM pads in New York City or on subway railings doesn't mean that you have infectious bacteria. Uh, here is an article that came out in uh, PLOS, I think it was PLOS One, yes, a couple of years ago from uh, a laboratory up at Columbia. Uh, zoonotic viruses associated with illegally imported wildlife. Apparently, people like to bring in pieces of monkeys, you know, heads and arms and so forth uh, from exotic places. They like to bring them in the U.S., and they get confiscated at the airports. You're not allowed to bring that stuff in. And so in this paper, they did, they did a sequencing study where they would grind up these samples and do deep sequencing, and they found viral sequences in them. Not surprising, because everything has a virus, many, many viruses in them, right? But what I... What we don't know is whether there's any infectious virus in it or not. If there were, that might be a threat, but if there isn't, and you can't say by sequencing, you know, here they got fragments of genomes. Um, you don't even know it's infectious. And that's why I say viruses associated with illegally imported wildlife is incorrect. I would say viral DNA would be the correct way to do it. Now on the right is the New York Times article written by Rachel Neuer, from the jungle to JFK, viruses cross borders and monkey meat. So that's wrong also. But she probably got it from the title of the paper because they used virus. So the scientists are at fault here for assuming that just because you have viral nucleic acid, you have an infectious virus. So again, um, if you want to show there's infectious virus, you have to do an infectivity assay. And in most of these studies, they don't do that. So the conclusion that there's virus present is not really correct. Now, of course, this, this wouldn't be a Times article if the headline were from the jungle to JFK, viral DNA crosses borders, right? Nobody would read it. So the editor would say, no, I don't want this story. 
So this is what I'm talking about. It's kind of an extension from last time. You know, the press kind of warps things to make it a little more interesting. And I want you to be aware of that. And remember, viral DNA is not infectious virus. <laughs>